Good morning. It's a joy to see each of you here this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here this morning because our Creator God has made us to worship Him. And He's made it possible for us to worship Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we gather this morning to hear from our Creator through His Word. Our call to worship scripture reading is from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And jumping down to verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. We're here because our Creator God has made all things well. Let's praise him for his creation. Our hymn of adoration this morning is, This is My Father's World. Please. Of course, you know, Zeke, he was dealing with all that stuff with the children of Israel and being in bondage. And they were wondering, well, God says, I'm going to bring you out. And they're going like, well, how? And God reminded Ezekiel, I was the one who put the water in the rivers. I'm the one who can take the water out of the rivers. I'm the one who puts a king in charge. And I'm the one who can, and you won't even have to lift a finger if I decide to do it my way. I'll do it. I'll make it happen. I'll make your everything happen as I see fit. This is my world. I'm so glad I serve that maker, aren't you? Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Let's go to our God in prayer, praising him as our creator. Lord, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts that you are our creator, God. 
Everywhere we look, we have reminders that you are the good creator, that even as this world suffers under the effects of sin, everywhere we look, we're reminded that you have made it all. When we see the skies, when we see the mountains, when we see the trees, even when we uh, see the birds and the other animals, sometimes animals that we might not want to see, we're reminded that you have made it all. You are the good creator, and we praise you for that. We're thankful for your creation. Lord, we're thankful and we praise you that you have made us, humanity, in your image. Lord, we know that the image is marred in us because of our sin. Just like our mother and father, Adam and Eve, sinned, we too sin. And so we have marred your image in us, but you have not abandoned us. Even as creation groans for your redemption, even as we're reminded by natural disasters that this is not the end, all of creation groans for your redemption. We're reminded that the battle is not done. Jesus who died will be satisfied and earth and heaven will be one. Lord, we long for that day and we pray that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. As we keep reading in Genesis, you're familiar with the story. You know that our mother and father, Adam and Eve, they sinned. Uh, the good creation of the garden in one and two is quickly marred by sin. But all the way back in Genesis 3, we have the promise of redemption. We know that the serpent crusher will come one day, and he did come. His name is Jesus Christ. The promised seed of Genesis 3 is the one who we can place our faith in, that divine lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. He is the one who has crushed sin. He is the one that our faith rests in, that we place our faith in and look to. And we know that because of Christ's salvation, we have assurance that he leads us every step of the way, and he does all things well. Let's continue in our service as we sing. of our Lord Jesus Christ as a good shepherd. He says, follow me, stay after me. Psalm 23, I am the good shepherd, so stay in the path and follow the directions I give you. All the way, my Savior leads me. He'll be our God even to death, David said, Psalm 48. Would you stand with us as we sing?
the ushers to make their way forward to receive the offering today. Third verse. All the way my Savior ushers come forward now to receive our offering today. Shall we pray? It's in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we enter once again into the throne room of God and, and present ourselves first as a sacrifice, as an offering back to you to be used for your honor and glory. Make each one of us be willing and clean vessels to be used. Secondly, Lord, we offer back what you've asked of us in giving back to you what you've, a portion of what you've given to us. We know that all the good things that we have in life, all the, the possessions, everything about our life is a gift from you. And so we offer this back to you. May you use this through the ministry of this church to be uh, bring praise and honor and glory to your name. We ask this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Lindsay's going to sing for us during the offering. I'm sorry, y'all need to go down. of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering to all the earth, resounds with ceaseless praise to the Son. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see and many put their trust in the sun christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation god's salvation of rage of crucify endured the cross as every sin was laid on the sun to the king who conquered death to free the poor and the oppressed for lasting peace for life and liberty in the sun Christ we through the sun let it be my life's refrain to live is Christ to die is gain deny myself take up cross and follow the sun let it be my life's refrain to live is christ 
Christ who dies came, deny myself, take up my cross and follow the Son. Christ we proclaim the name above every name, for all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the Son. Christ we and for Charlie and Teresa playing. Thank you, Terry, for leading us in our congregational singing this morning. Would you take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. If today happens to be your first Sunday with us, know that we are on a journey through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, this text is not chosen for any other reason than the fact that it comes up next in the book of 1 Peter. And even as Lindsay and Ethan sang... Uh, let it be our life's refrain to live as Christ and to die as gain. Let us take up our cross and follow the Son. In one sense, that's what Peter has been explaining to us these last several passages. He's been showing us what it looks like to follow Christ, even in a world that has done us wrong. And so we're going to see that lived out in, in the most intimate of relationships in our homes, in our marriages, in the text of this morning. So if you found your place in God's Word, would you stand for the reading of God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. God's Word says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the Word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Cultures change and opinions change, but God's Word does not change. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. God in heaven, we come to you this morning submitting to your word, submitting to your authority and to your text. We pray that your spirit would help us now to better understand your word, that we might all live our lives unto the Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's remind ourselves of where we are in the context of 1 Peter. Look up to chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, two verses that I told you we would uh, return to over and over. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when, not if, but when, they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Do you remember us looking at that? The, the big idea that we saw is doing good even when the world has done us wrong. Doing good even when the world speaks against us as evil. So what does that look like? We've seen so far that it, in at least one sense it, it looks like submitting to the right authorities in our lives. 
going from broad to narrow, Peter has addressed different spheres of influence, different spheres of responsibility. And within those various spheres, we all submit in various ways. So within the government, the broadest sphere of the world around us, the broadest category that Peter mentions, we saw that we submit for the Lord's sake to every human creation, whether to the emperor as supreme and so on. We submit to the law of the land as much as possible for the Lord's sake. And then we saw uh, two weeks ago that Peter addressed household slaves, which points us to the realm of our domestic employment today, our personal employment today. And we saw that doing good for the Lord's sake looks like submitting to our employers, to our masters, even when they are unjust. Why? Because Christ will reward us. Christ is our example, and Christ is our suffering substitute. So even in a sinful world, even in these worst-case scenarios that Peter lays out, we can endure suffering. We can glorify God by doing good in a world that's done us wrong. And part of what that looks like is by submitting to those in authority over us. In today's passage, Peter goes to the most intimate of relationships, that of husbands and wives, and the matter of submission in the home. Notice that Peter gives six verses of instruction to Christian wives, and only one verse of instruction to Christian husbands. Now before we think that Peter is being unfair, let me set the context before you. In the culture of that time, women were not encouraged to have friends of their own or faith of their own. Their friends and their faith were to go back to their husband. A Greek historian who lived during that time period, a man named Plutarch, here's what he said. A wife should not acquire her own friends, but should make her husband's friends her own. The gods are the first and the most significant friends, and for this reason it is proper for a wife to recognize only those gods whom her husband worships. That was the mindset of that day. And that's what the, the wives, the women who would receive this letter in the church that Peter has written to, this is the world that they're living in, that they're functioning in. In the first centuries of Christianity, women made up about one-third of the population, but about two-thirds of the membership of the church. And so, like today, uh, you would look around, you would see far more women professing faith in Christ and being a part of the life of the church than men. Christianity was often criticized for being a faith for only the foolish and the dishonorable and the stupid, only slaves, women, and little children, as one early critic put it. Do you remember that letter from a few weeks ago that I referenced from Governor Pliny to Emperor Trajan? In that letter, Pliny specifically mentioned only two Christians, and those two Christians were female slaves. That was meant to be a jab at Christianity. It was meant to say that in Christianity it would only appeal to those uh, that, that were considered weak during that time. But here's the beautiful thing about Peter's letter. Peter directly addresses both slaves and wives, slaves and women, acknowledging that they have a mind of their own and dignity and value and worth on their own. So I want you to imagine a woman who's been saved by the grace of Christ living during this day that Peter is writing. She wants to go spend time with a group of people that her husband knows nothing about. She wants to give some of her time and her talent to these people. She wants to use her resources as a household manager for something that she calls the kingdom of God. She talks about loving Jesus sometimes even more than she talks about loving her husband. No wonder Peter addresses six verses to Christian wives with unbelieving husbands. You see, when a husband embraced a new faith, it was expected that the family would go along whether or not they believed it, whether or not they agreed with it, uh, they would go along with it. But a wife embracing a new faith could pose great difficulty in the marriage. How should she win her husband to Christ? How should she love Jesus and her unbelieving husband who is opposed to Jesus. Now before I go any further, let me say that there are many of you who are for one reason or another are tempted to tune out this text. You would say, this text doesn't apply to me. 
You might be unmarried uh, for various reasons, perhaps due to your youth. You're not old enough to be married. Or perhaps uh, you're not married because of divorce or death. And so you think, well, this message is not for me. You might also be tempted to think, if we're just honest, you would say, I'm not going to listen to marriage advice from this young preacher. Well, let me tell you, I'm not here to give marriage advice, but I am here to preach the Word of God. And it's the duty of all of us, no matter our age or our marital status, to wrestle with God's Word, to wrestle with the Scriptures, and to understand what God has said. So here's the big idea of the text, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Wives are to graciously submit to their husbands, and husbands are to lovingly honor their wives, both for the sake of glorifying Christ in their marriage. Let me repeat that. The big idea is that wives are to graciously submit to their husbands, and husbands are to lovingly honor their wives, both for the sake of glorifying God in their marriage. Peter begins in verse 1, saying, Likewise, wives are to be subject to your own husbands. He says, in the same way that we've looked at submission in the world, in the same way that we've looked at submission in the workplace, likewise, we're going to look at submission in the home. Now, to be sure, when he says likewise, Peter is not saying that the master-slave relationship, which he just discussed, is the same as the husband and wife relationship. Some people would argue that, and they would seek to degrade the Bible's teaching on marriage, saying that Peter is comparing slavery and marriage. But remember that the institution of marriage is created by God before the fall of humanity, and God declared it to be very good. We read that this morning. But the institution of slavery is a result of the fall of humanity, and it is an offense to the Creator God who has made humanity in His image. So any comparison of marriage and slavery is not to be taken seriously at all. We've already stated in our study of 1 Peter that submission simply means to line up under the authority of another. But when it comes to submission in marriage, perhaps we ought to dig a little deeper. Before we look at what submission is, I want to look at what submission is not. Notice that Peter says, wives are to be subject to your own husbands. He doesn't say that all women everywhere are to be subject to all men everywhere. That would be a perversion of the biblical text. But he says, wives, be subject or submit to your own husbands. The idea of submission is, is wicked and vile in the eyes of the world today. It's commonly attacked in many so-called churches, and it's even misunderstood in faithful Bible-believing churches. You see, for many, biblical submission is an embarrassment to be hidden, not a truth to be embraced. But due to the sinfulness of humanity, we do want to be clear. We want to be cautious in the way we state what the Bible teaches. Author John Piper has given a list of, of several things that submission is not. And I'm not going to read the whole list, but I want to give you a few things from that list. I'm not going to expound upon them, but I just want to put these out here for you. Submission is not agreeing on everything. That may be good news to some of you. Submission does not mean agreeing to everything. Submission does not mean leaving your brain at the altar. It doesn't at all mean that the wife has to somehow give up her intelligence in order to submit to her husband. Submission is not putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. Christ demands our ultimate allegiance, not our husband's. And submission does not mean that a wife should not try to influence her husband. As we're going to see in this passage, in the most important matter in life, the salvation of our souls, absolutely wives ought to try to influence their husbands, and in so many other ways. There's lots of ways that submission has been distorted. The biblical teaching of submission can be abused. But what exactly is it? What exactly does it mean? Well, another pastor named Kevin DeYoung, he has helpfully explained that submission involves at least three verbs, three concrete actions. Here they are. Biblical submission for a Christian wife means at least support, respect, and following. Support, respect, and following. Now, this general principle of submission is for all marriages. All wives ought to submit to their own husbands, but but what about the worst-case scenarios? What if the husband is not a believer? 
Well, remember what we looked at uh, with the relationship between masters and servants in chapter 2, uh, verse 18. Peter said, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. Peter said, even in that worst case scenario, even if you find yourself serving an unjust master, you still ought to submit to them. And he explained why. Peter, now writing to believers, he says, now wives ought to submit to their own husbands, even in that worst case scenario when the husband is not a believer. He says there in verse 1, even if some do not obey the word. Now we've seen so far in our study of Peter's letter that obedience to the word is a reference to repentance and faith in Christ. So Peter is not saying that a wife should never try to share the gospel with her husband. Far from it. He's saying after a wife has shared the gospel with her husband, and after the husband has got fed up with it, when he says, that's enough, I don't want to hear anything else about this Jesus, then what is a Christian wife to do? Peter says, continue submitting, continue living your life in such a way that even when they don't believe the imperishable Word of God, when they disobey the Word, they may be one without a Word. They might be one by the conduct of their wives. You see this lost husband, he's heard the gospel and he does not believe. But the goal is that when he sees the respectful and pure conduct of his wife, he will begin to see the sincerity of her faith and ultimately believe. Just as the servant was encouraged to live not in fear towards her master, but ultimately with fear and reverence being focused on God, in the same way, wives are encouraged to live their lives with ultimate fear, ultimate respect directed toward God, and the overflow, the overflowing abundance of that reverence toward God is the submission towards their husband, their respectful and pure conduct toward their husbands. Now I want to repeat again the big idea that we've seen in this entire section of this letter from chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. When the world speaks against us as evildoers, they will see our good deeds and glorify God, hopefully by trusting Christ. So what does that look like when the world that is calling you evil happens to be your spouse? How do you respond then? Peter is teaching us over and over that when the world speaks against us as evildoers, they will see our good deeds and glorify God in heaven. Seeing is believing, so to speak. But let's be clear. Peter is not giving a formula or a promise. Some of you ladies have husbands who are not believers, and if you misunderstand this text as a formula or a promise, you will put an awfully great burden on yourselves. You will be tempted to think that if I just do this or if I just do that, then my husband will believe. Remember that God is the one who saves, not you. So be faithful to the task that Christ has given in your home and leave the results to Him. In verses 3 and 4, Peter points to what might be another misguided temptation for a wife in her quest to win her husband to Christ. He says in verse 3, Do not let your adorning be external the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. Verse 4, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. You see, in, in Peter's day, much like our own, there was a great fascination with external appearances. Even if women in that day did not have all of the tools that ladies you have today, you might be surprised at how similar things were. You see, women had the ability to dye their hairs, and they chose all sorts of colors, bright, unusual colors. And women of wealth would wear wigs, especially blonde wigs that were made from the hair of women who lived in a different part of the world. And women had very de detailed, ornate hairstyles, which would be the envy of fashion magazines today. One ancient writer talks about the business of beautification. Sounds a lot like the cosmetic in industry of today. And he said, so numerous are the tears and the stories piled one upon the, the other on top of their head. You see, the idea that the higher the hair, the closer to God is not a new concept. It was embraced all the way back in the ancient world. And of course, with great wealth brought the ability 
to buy uh, much gold jewelry and much fine clothing. Now consider the Christian woman who is seeking to win her husband to Christ. He's not happy with this new relationship that she has with these Christians. He's not sure that she's being faithful. There's obviously a tension in the marriage. It would seem to be an obvious temptation to the wife to say, well, listen, I will, I will keep his attention with my external appearances. I will keep him happy with the way that I look, and perhaps then he will listen to what I have to say about Christ. This is the line of thinking that Peter is addressing. Now, perhaps you've heard this text corrupted. You've heard a preacher forbid the styling of hair. You've heard a preacher forbid the wearing of jewelry. If that were true, then Peter would also be forbidding the wearing of clothes. And we know that's not what he's saying. The Bible doesn't forbid a wife dressing attractively and caring about how she looks, but it does emphasize that true beauty is not the external, but the internal. You see, 1 Samuel 16, 7 reminds us, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Christ's message to all of us throughout Scripture, but particularly here in this passage, to wives who are seeking to win their lost husbands, is to let your adorning be on the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. He doesn't say that a wife should be silent or that she should never have a conversation with any man apart from her husband. Rather, he's saying that her inner spirit is to be like Christ's. Christ said of himself, I am gentle and lowly of heart. Hairstyles, jewelry, and clothing will all fade away. Let your focus be on the imperishable beauty within, trusting that through this, Christ is working. Christ will save your husband by the imperishable word of God. Listen closely. Your faith may be foolishness in your husband's sight, but your faithfulness is precious in God's sight. I want to repeat that again because for some of you, I know this is an encouragement this morning. Your faith may be foolishness in your husband's sight, but your faithfulness is precious in God's sight. Peter has given us the principle of submission in verses 1 and 2. He's given a correction to our thinking here in verses 3 and 4. And now he gives us an example in verses 5 and 6. He says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Peter reminds us that God's truth is eternal. God's design for the garden is God's design for the saints of old. And God's design for the first century is God's design for the 21st century. This teaching on submission is not new. It's how the holy women of old who hoped in God adorned themselves. Notice that their holiness is not rooted in themselves. It's because they placed their hope and God. Sarah and the other faithful wives of old did not submit to their husbands because they thought their husbands always made the right decision or that their husbands were somehow superior to them. Far from it. Their hope was not in their husbands. Their hope was in God. Just as, repeat, as Peter has reminded us so far in this letter, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're to set our hope fully on the grace that will appear at His return so that our faith and our hope are in God. In the same way, the holy women of old placed their hope in God and their adorning was not in the externals, but the internals. They demonstrated their hope in God by submitting to their own husbands. Peter offers as a chief example, Sarah who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Sarah's outward actions of following Abraham's leadership mirrored her inner attitude of respect and honor towards her husband. Now, when Sarah calls Abraham Lord, she doesn't mean Lord in the same way that we call Jesus Lord. She's not looking to Abraham as her Savior, but as her leader. 
But here's what's remarkable about all of this. Abraham is a very flawed leader. Abraham was a very flawed husband. We don't have the time this morning to walk through the book of Genesis and see the narrative of Abraham and Sarah's marriage. But the Bible gives us several examples that show how Abraham failed as a husband. Yet the only time that we have uh, specifically mentioned in Scripture that Sarah refers to Abraham as Lord is not in the early years of their marriage. It's not before she knew better and she changed her mind. It's in the latter years of their marriage, well on advanced into years in Genesis 18. In that chapter, Sarah had just finished eavesdropping on the two angels who showed up to visit Abraham and to speak to them about their coming son, Isaac. Sarah is essentially in a private conversation with herself. There's nobody there but her and the Lord. And after decades of marriage with, Sarah, with Abraham, marriage that included many highs and many lows. Even then, in the privacy of her own heart, Sarah referred to her husband with honor and respect. Even in that most casual of moments, that's how she referred to her husband. So this is a reflection of Sarah's true character. You know, the Bible uh, speaks, uh, uh, describes Sarah as being very, very beautiful, even in her old age. But the emphasis it's not on the glory of her external, because the glory of her external was far surpassed by the beauty of her internal. Sarah's hope rested in God, and she demonstrated this by submission to her husband, Abraham. Now, Peter concludes this section by building off the New Testament teaching that by faith we are children of Abraham. And in the same way, any woman who adopts the adornment of Sarah is, in a sense, a daughter of Sarah. Well, how is that? He says, if you do good. There's that idea of doing good again that I told you keeps popping up over and over throughout this part of Peter's letter. And he also says, do not fear anything that is frightening. Now remember, Peter's constant refrain throughout this book is that our fear, our true reverence, our true allegiance belongs to God. Therefore, nothing else in this, work, in this world should truly cause us to fear. So, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how difficult it may be in that marriage to an unbelieving husband, ladies, let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart and let your fear and your hope be in God. In the second part of this passage, verse 7, Peter shifts his attention to husbands. Now, what might we expect him to say? Likewise, husbands, we might expect him to say submit. That's been the refrain throughout this part of the letter. Uh, we're to submit to the government, and slaves are to submit to their masters, and wives are to submit to husbands. And so we might expect that Peter is about to say, likewise, husbands, submit to your wives. But that's not what he says. Instead, he says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. God doesn't call the husband to submit, but rather to lead. Someone has stated helpfully that God's design for the home is a loving, godly, self-sacrificing, leading husband. What does this look like in action? Again, this pastor gives three verbs. He said, lead, sacrifice, and care. If you want to be a, a biblical husband, a faithful husband, lead, sacrifice, and care. How does Peter help us understand this? His command is that husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way. Live together according to knowledge, I believe is the way the King James puts it. Well, what knowledge is he referring to? Well, first and foremost, the knowledge of who God is. The same way that all these other commands have been rooted in the believer's relationship with Christ, the husband's behavior towards his wife is to be rooted in his personal relationship with God, his knowledge of God. But furthermore, a husband is to know his wife in every way, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I don't need to tell you that this requires time and effort. No matter how long you've been married, the need to live with your wife in an understanding way never ceases. 
The responsibility to study your wife and to learn more about her and to care for her never ceases. But then Peter has a difficult saying. He says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, contrary to what you might think, the Bible nowhere teaches that women are intellectually weaker or emotionally weaker than men. What does this leave us with? It leaves weaker physically. But even then, this is a generalization. What have many of you been doing the last two weeks? You've been watching the Olympics on television. We've seen some of the greatest athletes in the world, both men and women, participate in the Olympics. And many of those women who are some of the greatest athletes in the world could uh, completely eviscerate most of the men here in this room. So let's just be honest. There's always an exception to the rule. But this is a general statement of comparison. Most husbands are generally stronger than their wives. Therefore, live with your wife in an understanding way. And I must pause to clearly, clearly emphasize that neither this passage nor any passage in the Bible permits the physical, emotional, mental, or sexual abuse of a woman. So if you're experiencing abuse in your home, please seek help and safety today. I didn't say seek a divorce. I said seek help and safety today. The church is here to stand with you. Please know that. Peter continues by saying, show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Men are made in the image of God. Women are made in the image of God. Men are responsible to repent and believe in Christ. Women are responsible to repent and believe in Christ. Men have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and women have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Never let anyone tell you that Christians believe in the inferiority of women. No Bible-believing Christian believes that women are inferior to men. The Bible teaches complementary yet different roles, but not inferiority of worth. Husbands ought always to live with their wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, since she is the joint heir of the grace of life with you. This week I began reading a book called Good Christians, Good Husbands. And it detailed the stories of, of three famous Christians, three famous revivalists, and their marriages. It was uh, George Whitfield and John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards. Three men who lived in approximately the same time period that God used to do wonderful things for the revival of Christianity throughout North America and Western Europe. And all three men, believing essentially the same thing, living in essentially the same time period, had different marriages. And the one that stood out to me the most was John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, and his, his brother, a great theologian who wrote uh, many wonderful, wonderfully rich uh, lyrics that we still sing to this day. But John Wesley, while, while he was never unfaithful to his wife, he did not live in an understanding way with his wife. He, he did many foolish things. He conducted himself in relationships with other people in a very foolish way. And he was not sensitive to the needs of his wife. And as you read this, uh, 200 years later, you're thinking, how could any man be this foolish? And yet then I pause and wonder, well, what will someone say about me? 200 years from now. How foolish am I being at times neglecting the needs of my wife? So each of us, husbands, no matter how faithful we are in many areas of life, have to always constantly, diligently seek the wisdom of God and how we can live with our wives in an understanding way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since she is a joint heir of the grace of life with you. She receives the benefits, the blessings of this life with you, and she will receive the benefits and the blessings of the next life with you as well. Why ought we to live this way? He says something very interesting at the end. So that our prayers may not be hindered. So that our prayers may not be hindered. If a believing husband is married to an unbelieving wife, and he's praying that his wife would submit to Christ, but he's treating her like garbage... Don't be surprised 
when God does not bless your prayers, don't be surprised when she does not want to listen to the things you have to say about Christ. Likewise, if you're trying to assert your authority in the home and you're not lovingly leading, don't be surprised when your wife does not respond well to your attempts. And don't be surprised when your prayers are hindered. Now, I've only scratched the surface of the entire Bible's teaching on God's design for the home. But I pray that I've been faithful to this text. You may have questions about something that I've said, and I welcome those conversations with you. Even when we struggle against God's good design, because of our sinful nature, uh, we can still affirm that God's ways are higher than ours, and God's plan is very good. So any questions that you might have about what is said this morning is due to the deficiency of my explanation, not due to the deficiency of God's good design. I want to conclude by reiterating that you are responsible for the command given to you. You're not responsible for the command given to your spouse. Husbands, you better not go home today and say, wife, you better start submitting more. And wives, you ought not to go home today and say, husbands, you ought to start honoring me more. As my professor drilled into my head in seminary, husbands, we have a lifetime ahead of learning what it means to lovingly lead our wives. And wives, you have a lifetime ahead of learning what it means to graciously submit to our husbands. Our work is never done. And if you feel overwhelmed this morning, thinking that this is impossible, remember that Peter has already given us the proper motivation. He said in chapter 2, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. The reason we find this to be so hard is because we live in a fallen, sinful world, and we can't do anything about it. But Christ can. What did Christ do? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Are you wounded in your marriage today? Are you failing to love and to lead as you ought? Look to Christ today. By his wounds you have been healed. His wounds can heal the wounds of your home. His wounds can bring healing to your marriage. It's never too late for restoration. Would you look to Christ today? Perhaps you've realized this morning that after hearing God's word preached that in fact you are the unbelieving one. You're someone who has not been obedient to the call of Christ. Would you repent of your sins and trust Christ today? He has already taken on your sins and carried him in his body that you might die to sin and live to righteousness. Would you do that today? Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. God in heaven, we come to you acknowledging your perfect design and acknowledging our fallen state. We know that we need you. Would you be very near to us this morning? Would you make each of us, uh, would you make it clear to each of us how we ought to respond to your word, how we ought to live in our present state, no matter what the marital status of each person here, how we can live lives in submission to you, Christ. We pray that it would be clear by your spirit. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you find Christ's words difficult, remember that the difficulty is not in his design, but with our understanding. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and just to take him at his word. Is that your response today? I pray so. Let's stand and sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust.
trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just to simply and life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him precious jesus savior friend and i know that he is with me will be with me to the end jesus jesus how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace trust him more. Thank you, and you may be seated. As many of you know, this is the time of year for school to start back, and some of you uh, kids and grandkids have already started back. For Palmetto across the street here, they're starting back tomorrow, I believe. And so I want the focus of uh, our prayer today, my pastoral prayer, uh, to be for the, for the children and for the schools and teachers and administrators. And as I often say, I want you to, to listen and follow along. And if you agree with what I say at the end, say amen along with me. Let's go to our God in prayer. Lord, we come to you today knowing that uh, this is the time for school to begin all over our country. And so we pray uh, as our school just across the way here and the other schools nearby have started or are starting soon, Lord, we pray that you would bless these students. Would you help them to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man? Would you help them to take the, the privilege of their education seriously, that they would love you with their mind? Lord, we pray for the teachers there's so many faithful and good teachers that want to, to shape their students for good. Would you give them patience? Would you give them wisdom? Would you equip them for every good work? For the administrators of the school, Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom for the difficult decisions that they have to face, so many of them that we never even realize. Would you help them to administer justly and rightly to lead your, the schools in, in ways that honor you? Lord, we pray for protection for everyone involved at these schools. Protect them from all harm, protect them from evil, and for would you protect them from all who would teach contrary to your ways. Lord, we pray for the parents. We pray that you would equip them to, to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray that they would take their Deuteronomy 6 responsibility seriously, that no matter who offers the, their children the day-to-day -day instruction, whether uh, their children are in public schools or charter schools or private schools or, or homeschooled, Lord, that each parent would be reminded that it's their responsibility to lead and shepherd their children to Christ. Would you be with the volunteers and with the, the grandparents and all who support and undergird the school systems, Lord? Would you bless them, meet their needs in the days ahead? We pray all of these things in the name that is above every name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I trust that the Lord is pleased with our worship this morning as we've drawn near to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Visitors who are here this morning, we're so glad that you're here. You'll see in the pew in front of you a, a green card. You can take that and fill that out uh, just to let us know who you are and if there's ways that we can be praying for you. Uh, you can drop that. Uh, there's probably a plate on the table in the back. You can hand it to the men at the back. You can hand it to the person next to you. One way or the other, we'll be sure to get it, and we appreciate you doing that. 
I want to thank everyone who came out for our work day yesterday. We had a, a lot of fun. We got some things cleaned up and, and taken care of, and I, I'm thankful for that. Those of you who didn't have opportunity yesterday, go ahead and, and just fill out that timesheet and give it to the treasurer, and she'll tell you what to do with it, all right? No, that's a joke. She's still, she's waiting to process that. Thank you all all for all that you did uh, to, to help make those things possible. One of the things I want to let you know about is, is this room right out here in the foyer. It's the counting room. It's the bridal suite. It's the hospitality suite. It does everything. And so we got it, we got it cleaned up and cleaned out yesterday. And so the goal is that uh, anyone, if you see guests or if you have children and grandchildren who are here and they need to, to step out with a child or perhaps uh, change the child or nurse the child, all of that is available in that room. We've got a changing table. We've tried to make it more comfortable. And uh, we're even working on a way that they would be able to, to hear the service in there as well. And so I just wanted to let you know about that. And uh, each week, of course, the ushers who are back there will let them know that as well. Um, I believe the next thing I actually do have a slide about, Itasca, you can put that up. We're trying to coordinate so that the slides go together. Look at that. All right, so we are planning in November, Lord willing, the first week of November, to take a church-wide trip to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Many of you have let me know that you are, are ready to travel. We're ready to get that bus in shape and, and get on the road. And so there's an interest meeting on Wednesday, August 25th at 5.30 downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. You can sign up. And listen to what you're signing up for. You're just signing up to show your interest. You're not committing to anything. You're not signing in blood. You're not paying your money yet. You're just signing up to show your interest. And if you could do that on the church website or talk to my wife, Lindsay, we want to get a head count of people who are interested so that we can get the proper uh, room rates to know how much it would cost for each person to go. Now, we're doing this in faith, uh, assuming that, uh, as we've seen in other parts of the world, even as the virus is spiking, uh, that that is a, a short-term thing. And so we're trusting that the Lord will allow us to do this come November. So if you're interested in that, please sign up on the website, talk to Lindsay, and we'll, uh, we'll be getting you more information about that. But if you have questions, just go ahead and ask and let us know. Next Sunday is homecoming. I, I would urge you to continue praying for homecoming. As we've mentioned many times, our prayer and our desire that this will not be just a day of celebration. It will certainly be that. But a day of a new season, a new beginning for so many people uh, who perhaps have walked away from the church and aren't going anywhere else. And we want them to know that they can come worship our risen king here with us. So I pray that uh, you would join me in prayer for homecoming as, as next Sunday approaches. Uh, remember that Sunday school is canceled and that uh, the service begins at 10.30. If you, if you come at 11, who knows what we'll be doing by then, so make sure you come at 10.30. Um, many of you have asked what, what are the plans in light of, of COVID on the rise in some ways. Uh, my, my plan is, is to, to treat you as adults and let you do what you wanna do. So if you wanna wear a mask, please feel free to do that. You're, you will not be embarrassed or ashamed in any way about that. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable hanging around for the meal or for the afternoon session, that's fine. If everybody goes home, then we'll, we'll all go home. We'll know that nobody's left to do anything with. But I want to encourage you to do what you need to do uh, to feel safe and comfortable. You know your own health and you know uh, the needs of your family. And so I want you to, to do uh, as you feel led with that. So our plan is still to do everything as, as planned next Sunday. And we'll adjust accordingly with, with whatever we need to do. So be in prayer for that. Make sure if there's other people that you know would be interested in coming and they haven't, uh, maybe you haven't told them about it yet, make sure to tell them this week they're welcome to come to homecoming. All right, this Tuesday morning, the ladies' Bible study will begin. Uh, the men met this last Tuesday night. We had a, had a good time, and I know that the ladies are going to do that this, this Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning, from 9.30 to 11, downstairs in the fellowship hall. If you have any questions about that, you can ask Lindsay about that as well. We look forward to seeing you there. She looks forward to seeing you there. I'll probably hide, but I will be around somewhere. Uh, that means second Tuesday of the month, Deacon Fellowship, this Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Join us in prayer uh, for the church and, and ways that we need to conduct business. So I pray that you would be a part of that. This Wednesday night, we will have prayer meeting, as usual, downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. But for now, choir rehearsal has been canceled, and we will give you any further updates about that as we need to. All right. Have I forgotten anything? All right, Terry's going to lead us in the last verse of This Is My Father's World, and then I will send us out with a benediction from God's Word. This is my Father's world, oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the
shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. One other thing I did forget to mention related to the Bible study. If you look on the table out there, we've still got flyers. We've got plenty of those. So if you need one of those to give to somebody, do that. We also have small business cards that have the, the short amount of information that might be easier for you to give to people. So even though they've begun, people are still welcome to join at any point in time. And so we would encourage you to keep inviting people and let them be a part of that with us. As you go throughout this week, even as we seek to submit to the authority of Christ in all realms, including in the home, Christ sends us with his blessing. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in peace.